Today, we start talking about Programming 2 with Java. So hello everyone, I'm at Florida Polytechnic University. New job, new class, let's get started. This is gonna be the third programming class, uh, class you would take at this institution. And basically what happens is this will be the first class you the students will have used Java. They will have already taken a C++ class and a Python class for programming. So I'm going to expect that you guys have a pretty good understanding of imperative programming and a little bit of understanding with OOC. And this class is going to focus a lot on object-oriented coding. So real quick, let's talk about the difference between Java and C++. Syntactically, they're very similar but they live in completely different places. Now this is a very simplified version of what's happening when you compile both of these different technologies, but just a quick overview, if I have a C++ file with a .h file, or a .cpp and a .h file, and I compile it, after it goes through the linker, and after it, goes through, it gets compiled, and once it's compiled, it goes to bytecode. Once I run that program, that program runs directly on the hardware, or through the operating system, but it will still be running directly on the hardware, the code will. In Java, you're going to have a, a Java file which gets compiled to a class file which then will run on the Java virtual machine allowing Java a greater portability and then that will run on the op that will then connect and talk to the host operating system which will then eventually run on the hardware. The difference here is uh, Java is much more abstract or higher level than C++ is which gives us some pros and cons. One, there's more strictness with type checking. Now, some people will say this is a bad thing, but the strictness with type checking is actually uh, leads to better code. So I, I would count this as a good thing. There's a garbage collector. This is a wonderful thing to have, and if you've ever done dynamic memory with C++, you know how dangerous dynamic memory can be without having the garbage collector. Pointers are handled internally, so you can use pointers, but you don't have to worry about what they're, you know, incrementing or incrementing or decrementing them. More options for OOC programming. Now technically C++ and Java can do the same thing with OOC, but Java has more explicit options for different levels of abstraction than C++ does, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Again, at a functionality level, you can do the same thing with both technologies. The cons. Java is going to be slower. It's running on a virtual machine, which is going through the operating system to connect to the hardware. It's going to be slower. Hardware access is more cumbersome, uh, both with things like drivers or uh, devices and things like uh, threads are going to be a little bit trickier with Java than they are in C++. So you're not going to be able to take advantage of all the things the operating system can normally do that you can with C++. And finally, there's no point or arithmetic. However, that being said, I would, I would actually say this is probably a good thing. It ties back into the pointers are handled internally. You can't actually manually manipulate the pointer. Um, so on a certain level, that does restrict the programmer what, what he or she can do, but also protects the programmer at the same time. All right, this is the basics to NetBeans. And again, this is going to be kind of a quick introduction. Um, I expect most of this will look familiar because you guys have taken C++. What may not look familiar is the overall design or format of a Java package. So here, if I open up NetBeans, I go File, New, New Project, or I hit the box. This little option will come up. I'm just, right now, I'm just going to select Java and Java Application, hit Next, give my application a name, and then select where I want to put this. Make sure you organize your folders so you don't lose track of this because this folder is what you're going to zip up and submit for your homework. Then I hit finish. Make sure this is checked. It'll make the static void main for you and it'll give you a kind of a boilerplate project code. Now what you're not going to have is you're not going to have these two lines here. We'll talk about that in a moment. And you're not going to have anything inside this function. This is all everything I've written or this function. But you are going to get a uh, the main class, the public class, intro, and then you're going to get a public static void main. So if you've had a C++ or C background, this is your main function. This is where the code starts executing. 
So I'm just going to go through kind of the, the real simplicit, simple stuff right now. And then again, hopefully this is review for you. So I have integers in Java. This kind of looks very similar to C++. Uh, chars. Notice the chars have a single quote, just like C++. And then here in Java, I do have strings as, that act as a primitive. So I go string my word equals bat, and I can use double quotes. So this is really nice. I cannot, however, use double equals with a string. So I must be careful with that. I'll show you an example a little bit later. But So I can use uh, an assignment operator for a string, but I, I should not use a double equals operator. I have floats. If I use the floats, I have to specify um, the F at the end of the literal. Otherwise, Java is going to think this is a long, and it's going to throw an error saying you're trying to convert a long to a float. So here's an example, uh, or a double, sorry, not a long, I apologize, double. Here's an example of a double, and then here I do not need the F because this will give my maximum amount of um, uh, numbers I can contain after the decimal point. I also have longs, which is a really large int. It's a 64-bit int uh, versus the normal int, which is 32. And then I have a byte, which is, will store a byte value. Notice I have to convert it to a byte. I believe I can also convert chars to bytes as well. And then in Java, I also have a Boolean type. So Boolean, my test, is set equal to true. Java is very picky about uh, making sure that you put a boolean in, say, a selective structure, like an if statement or a while loop or an f loop or a for loop. So in those situations, in, in C++, you get sloppy, and if, as long as the integer was not a zero, it was true, and if it was a zero, it was false. You can't do that in Java. You actually have to have a boolean value or have a boolean operator. We'll get to those in a moment. Here is how I'm going to print out to the console. It's always good to know how to print out to the console. If I do system.out.print, it will go. It will not print a line afterwards. If I do system.out.println, it will print a line after it. Uh, if I want to input from the keyboard, there's two ways to do it in Java. This is the easy way. You don't want to see the hard way. The hard way involves something called buffered reader. You can look it up if you really want to. Um, this is the scanner class. It's nice. It's easy to get up and running. And I, I think I want to say that the buffered reader is the only reason it's better is because it has more exceptions that can be thrown. So if I was designing, say, an enterprise level software, I could catch more problems that might occur with the buffered reader. But this will work fine for our system or for our, what our needs. And I'm not even sure if that's true. I think scanner, I know scanner will throw in, uh, exceptions as well. So I'm not sure if there's actually any real reason not to use scanner. So I'm going to type scanner input equals new scanner system dot in. This is one of those things you're just going to have to remember. The system dot in means your keyboard. And then this is creating a class, it's creating an object actually. So it's object of type scanner equals a new, this is the constructor call with a parameter system dot in. Now, if you don't remember your classes, your constructor calls, don't panic. This is just something you're going to have to do. When you do this, you're going to get an error because it doesn't know what scanner is. If you click on the error, you'll see the first option will say import java.util.scanner, and then you'll get your first import up here. It'll, it'll actually import it for you. This is actually really nice. So once I have this object, I can use it to get an input uh, a variable. So I'll do system dot that print line enter an integer, and then I'll say my int equals input dot next int. Uh, dot next int is obviously the next integer entered on the keyboard. Um, dot next is the next string. Dot float, and then there's a couple other ones here. I'll show you real quickly. So next um, I have a pattern I can look for I can look for a string I can look for a big decimal big integer big integer boolean byte double float int a line a long and the line I think will take in 90 characters if I remember right and then so I have a couple different things I can bring in here notice I cannot bring a character directly in so if I want a character I have to um, bring in the string and then get the individual character from it 
So those are different options you have for your input. So here I'm going to say my int equals input dot next int. So I'm going to have to enter. This is going to stop the program. This is going to stall the program. Now the system dot out dot print line. The number you enter it is, and this is how I concatenate a value to a, a constant string. Java will automatically convert this into a string. That's really nice on Java's part. So whatever number I entered will be printed here. The if statements are exactly like C++, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. If my int is less than 50, print your less your integer is less than 50. My int is greater than 50, integer is greater than 50. Else, my integer is equal to 50. Now this logic is exclusive, so it's impossible for multiple these multiple options here to be true. But also, remember the if, else if, and else. Even if this logic wasn't exclusive. The else if else is exclusive. So the minute one of these is true, the rest of them is going to be ignored. So if this is true, these two are not going to be checked. If this is true, then this one's not going to be checked. And only if these two are false will the else be checked. So they're exclusive to each other. If I did not have an if here, or this else here, I should say, these two if statements would not be exclusive. And I could potentially, if my logic was different, end up with having both of them being true. Here are my Boolean operators I mentioned earlier, exactly like C++ again. I have less than, greater than, double equals, not equals, less than or equals, and greater than equals are the valid Boolean operators. And this, and these values will be numeric. Um, if I need to do a string, I'll show you that in a moment, but these values are for numeric values, and they will return a Boolean type, which can be used inside here. So I don't actually have to create a Boolean variable if I want to use a, a selective structure. I just have to make sure whatever is inside these parentheses evaluates to a Boolean type. So a couple more things. We have the while loop. So while my int is greater than 2, I'm going to divide uh, my int divide equal 2. This is shorthand, so it's going to basically divide by 2 and assign that value back to my int. This is the same as me typing my int. My int equals my int divide by two. These two statements are the same. Uh, but remember, this is going to be integer division because my int's a division uh, integer. So this is going to give me a integer and while this is greater than 2, or I'm going to print it out, then while it's greater than 2, it's going to keep doing this. So basically, I'm just going to divide my number by 2 until it's less than 2. Um, here I have the do while loop. The only, remember, the only trick down here is at the while's at the end, and the semicolon has to come after the while. It's kind of a weird syntax. Remember that the while loop, can, this, this situation might be false. Like, my int might be 0. If that's the case, this whole thing would be false and never run. The do while will always run at least once. So here I say enter a word, then I do my word equals input dot next. Remember, my word is a string. And then we're going to do this while my word, and now here's how I compare um, for strings. I can do dot and it equals in your case quit. So any case combination of quit, this will be true. If it's true, then it, this statement will be false. If I do not enter quit, then this statement will be true because it's false equal equal false, and then it will keep going. Um, I could also use equals, but then the case does matter. Now, if I want to use the C, C++ way, I can use a function called dot compare to, and this will return an integer that will return negative if the first word comes earlier in the, in the dictionary positive if the first word comes um, later in the dictionary, and zero if the two words are the same. So I can, I can os also do this option as well. And then we have the classic for loop, which is exactly like C++ for my int equals zero, my int is less than 10, my int plus plus, system.printout line what my int is, and then we're good. 
So like I said, these control structures are almost exactly the same as R and C++. That's why I'm not spending a lot of time on them. Now, one thing I want to mention was functions. We're going to come back to functions when we get into classes, but here we have static void main. This is a static function. So in order to call another function from this function, we have to have a static function. So if I want to, I can say static int hit number int max. So very similar to, uh, don't worry about the static at the moment, just know that if we're going to have a, like a set of functions we have to call from main, they have to be static. Pardon me. This, just like C++, is going to be a return type. This is the function name. This is the parameter set in one integer. So the, unlike C++, I do not need a header function for this. So I don't have to have like my little header up here telling the compiler, oh, there's going to be a function with this signature. I can just write the function. So that's one another nicety Java gives you. So I'm going to call this number. I'm going to send in 25. And here's how I get a random number in Java. I do random ran equals new random. When you write this, again, I'm creating an object random called with a name ran. It's going to give you an error. And you'll have to do the same thing. You click on it, and then it will give you this import um, java.util.random. That way you don't have to memorize it. Once I have that, I can do return rand, this is the object I made, rand.mixed int, and then this, this value will send in the max of the integer I, I want to get, so in this case 25, and it will give me a number between 0 and 25. And I can't remember if this is, like, I think this is, I think this is inclusive. I have to double check that. I think that's an easy way to find out. It's, ex it's exclusive. So this is going to return, in this situation, it's going to return a number between 0 and 24. So this is just the size of, this is just the range of the random number, not the max value. If I wanted it to be 1 to 25, I could do plus 1 here. Whatever value is returned, notice I have to specify my return value just like C++. This integer is going to be replaced, this function call, whatever gets returned, and then I'm going to print it out. So we run this, we enter an integer, we'll say 44. So here uh, it says my integer is less than 50. It's going to divide by 2 until I get down to 2. That's going to end the while loop. Here I can enter words. I can enter all the words I want um, until I type quit. And I can use whatever capitalization I want, and then it will quit that while loop. Here's the for loop, which counts to 10, or 0 to 9, actually. And then the random number that was returned in this situation was 1. So let me run this one more time just to prove to you that that is random. We'll do 55. We'll say the number is integer is greater than 50, and it counts down until it gets to 1. So just quit. And now the random number is 7, and again you see the for loop run. So this number has changed between runs, that's because it is in fact random. So that is a really, really quick overview of the imperative structures in Java. Again, it's very similar to um, C++. I wouldn't too worry too much about the functions as long as you get the general gist of the functions and know that this need, there needs to be a static here. We will come back to functions when we get into classes. Thanks for watching. Uh, please make sure you have a good understanding of the basic imperative commands in Java, your if statements, your while loops, your for loops, your do whiles, switch statements. And I know I didn't cover it in this video, but please make sure you look up basic arrays in Java. Very similar to C++. Um, this has been Toll Talks. Until next time, cheers. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something and enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a comment or a like below. And again, thank you.